So, let's go for a drive. Now, one of the things I like about electric cars is, well, they accelerate well, because electric motors have all of their torque from zero. You don't have to wait for the revs to build up and, and find the power. So, let me <laughs> demonstrate by getting to 100 in that time. <laughs> this thing does it in 4.9 seconds. That's supercar quick. Well, it was 10 years ago. It's just really quick now. This is the Volvo XC40. I think it is one of the coolest looking SUVs on the planet. Stylish, sophisticated, it is overflowing with Scandi cool which, given it comes from Sweden, that makes a lot of sense. But the boffins from Gothenburg, they wanted to make it cooler. How did they do that? Well, they threw out the internal combustion engine, they put two powerful electric motors, one at either end, and they crammed a really hefty battery pack under the floor. And voila, or whatever the Swedish word for voila is, we got the Recharge Pure Electric. We've got a lot to get through in this video. We're going to find out if the Volvo XC40 is better as an electric car and therefore worth quite a bit more money. And hopefully at some point we're going to find out what the Swedish word for voila is. Before we get onto that though, we're going to talk about all the things we normally talk about in this video. We're going to talk about how much it costs, what you get, what's in it, how much space there is, what it's like to drive, warranty, servicing, the whole bit. So stick around for all of that. If you want to skip to those particular bits, they're all chopped up down below in the chapter markers. Just go down to the YouTube scrubby bar thing and hit the bit that you want. Of course, before you do that, hit subscribe and hit the bell button so you get a little notification every time we put a new video on the channel. And if you like the video, hit like and get involved in the comments. We love talking to you about these cars. Right, I think that's everything. Let's get on with it. So it's, it's basically an XC40, and why would you change it? There's no good reason for it. You do get that blanked out grille at the front here, which is kind of cool, but it just shows you that it's electric because you don't need the cooling. It's got big wheels, most of them have big wheels. It's got a black roof, a lot of them have a black roof. A few little badges scattered around, but it kind of goes incognito. What I really like about this is, Volvo has a reputation for being boxy. So instead of trying to get away from that, they've gone, we're gonna do boxy and you're gonna love it. And that kind of gets at a bit of a comparison with Range Rover, but I think that's unfair because this car absolutely stands on its own and I love its individuality. So at the front here we have the grille, the big <clears throat> hammer of Thor LED headlights with all sorts of bending and leveling and it even has heated washer jets. I never understood the point of these until driving in a snowy winter. There's some pointless detail for you. In profile, I reckon the XC40 looks amazing. Of course, the recharge is no different. You've got so many straight lines. How many car companies can get away with this many straight lines and this much box and look this good? It's such a great piece of design and I'm glad they haven't changed a thing. Around the back here, you've got the signature stacked tail lights with some lovely shapes in them, a couple of subtle badges, and that's pretty much it. Not much is new, but going to town would be a crime. The Volvo XC40 Recharge Pure Electric starts and finishes at $76,990 plus on roads. You're probably wondering how I got that wrong. Well, at the time of filming, it was right. Since then, Volvo has added a front wheel drive version for $72,990 and then used that as an excuse to add three grand to this car, taking it to $79,990, knocking it out of contention for stamp duty concessions in some states. So it's good that you can get a cheaper one and knowing that this one is now so much more expensive. So anyway, I'll mention during this video that I want a front wheel drive one with more range, but unfortunately, Volvo has fitted the smaller 69 kilowatt hour battery, so bank on about 300 kilometers of range from the cheaper one. And you get 20 inch alloys, a 14 speaker sound system with a nine inch touchscreen, dual zone climate control, digital dashboard, leather interior, heaps of safety, sat nav, Android automotive, wireless charging, and powered everything. So at this point, we should probably have a little chat about the Polestar 2. Yes, it's based on the same platform, but it's quite a different car. The Polestar 2 is like a higher riding five door lift back hatchback kind of thing, whereas the XC40 is more that traditional SUV. They're quite different cars, even though they do share a lot of stuff. 
As you might expect, this is a very good interior. I mean, all the XC40 interiors are good, and this is obviously no exception because it is one. I love the little textures around the car, the shapes, and I like how they've kind of taken ownership of the idea that the screen is portrait rather than landscape, and so everything else is kind of vertically arranged. It looks good. I, I love these air vents. They look great, and they get a lot of air out of them too. In front of you here, you've got a digital dashboard. It's not full of features. It's not like an Audi virtual cockpit or a BMW live cockpit, but one of the cool things is when you have the maps in there, it does fill everything out. It looks really good. And when you're charging, you plug in, it'll show you the percentage of charging that you're up to, which is like the Polestar 2. I really like this steering wheel. It's, it's the right size, right shape, not too many buttons. Some, some steering wheels have like 27 buttons on them, and I'm not exaggerating. This is a much more sensible layout. Now, while I like the digital dashboard, I don't like this screen very much. It's not that the hardware is bad, but the software is really not great. Well, it's bits of it are good, but on the whole, it's just not a very good system. It's not as good, again, as the Polestar 2s, which has a later version of Android Automotive. The layout's a bit ho-hum. Uh, it takes a while to respond. Sometimes it takes a long time to respond. And when you've got a lot of functions built into the screen, it really needs to be snappy or it's not going to work out very well for you. The climate control is crammed in here as well, uh, and that can sometimes be a bit tricky to get into because you kind of got to swipe it up and it's right down on the bottom against the bezel, which is a bit of a pain. Um, it doesn't have Apple CarPlay. That is really irritating. Now, Volvo says, oh, well, you don't need Apple CarPlay. This is all very good. Rubbish. Apple CarPlay is really good. So is Android Auto. Uh, and not being able to have that in a modern car is a bit silly. It is coming next year, so hopefully it's coming as part of a big uplift in the Android Automotive. Okay, I'm going to stop whining about that. Now, there's plenty of storage. You've got two cup holders here. You've got wireless charging under here, which is really good. And again, it's set up that way rather than that way. You know, a bit of a think about it. One of the cool things about this car is you just get in with the key in your pocket. There's no stop start button and you just flick it into drive and away you go. Uh, and I like this small it doesn't have to be big and taking up space it's just the right size you've got a bin under here plus you've got an actual bin look at this Feed me! Uh, i didn't quite understand it until i worked out you could lift it out so that was really handy the seats they're really really comfortable lots of adjustment uh, they're not big seats but they're really really comfortable got bottle holders in the doors and the door pockets are lined with carpet so don't spill anything sticky in there because you're never getting that out. And it's full of light. Of course, it's got this massive sunroof. So no matter what the lighting conditions are, unless it's night, you're going to get a ton of light in here, which makes it feel a lot bigger than it is. Because it's not a huge cabin. Roomy, but not huge. Let's have a look in the back. Here in the back, things are quite comfortable. It's, well, I'm sitting behind where I drive. I've got plenty of knee room, plenty of foot room. Leg room, look, I'd like a little bit more under here from the seat. The seat part is a little bit short, but apart from that, you know, on these outboard seats, very, very comfortable. In winter, you'll be looked after too because you have heated seats on these outboard seats and that goes with the heating on the front. Heated seats are a thin electric cars because they're cheaper to run on energy than a heater. So, little tip for young players there. Uh, you've got cup holders and I can demonstrate the cup holders because a colleague thoughtfully left behind a coffee cup in the car. And you can tell it's not mine, it's a skim flat white, and I'm not going to name the person, um, Jez, who left it there. Um, what else have we got? We've got air vents, very important in a family car. You've also got a charge a pair of USB-C here. So you're well looked after back here. You've also got small bottle holders in the doors, but I think the main thing here is it's very comfortable and a ton of headroom, and that's probably one of the main differences in the cabin between as far as space goes, between this and the Polestar 2, you've got a lot more headroom even with this massive sunroof. So yeah, this is a pretty good back seat for a car this size. Here in the boot, it's a little bit smaller than the internal combustion engine cars. Space is down by about 10% to 418 litres, that's down from 460. That's on the small side of competitive, but as you can see, it's quite big. You've got a through loading port and under here you've got space for the cable. Now, if you don't want your cable there, you can go out the front of the car, which has the frunk or the fruit or whatever you want to call it. That's got another 31 litres, which is plenty of room for this. And underneath, you'll find the tyre repair kit because this car doesn't have a spare. B 
being a Volvo, it is packed full of safety stuff. You start with seven airbags, ABS, stability and traction controls, forward and rear AEB, forward collision warning, rear collision warning, blind spot monitoring, around view cameras, reversing camera, front and rear parking sensors, it's absolutely packed. You also get two isofix points and three top tether anchors for the kiddies. And of course, being a Volvo, it's got a five star ANCAP rating. The XC40 has two 150 kilowatt electric motors for a total of 300 kilowatts, which is a lot of power. There's one motor at the front and another at the rear for all wheel drive through a single speed gearbox. The lithium ion battery is a 78 kilowatt hour system with 75 kilowatt hours usable and 150 kilowatt 400 volt charging capability. Running at full tilt, you'll charge it in 40 minutes. If you've got access to a 50 kilowatt charger, it'll take around two hours. Running off the cable at home, you'll need almost a whole day, so like most EVs, it's best for a top-up. The official WLTP range is 418 kilometres, but every time we've charged this to the recommended 90%, it tells us it will do 350 kilometres. The XC40 Pure Recharge Electric comes with a five-year unlimited kilometre warranty and an eight-year warranty applies to the battery. Volvo says that the drive system is sealed for life, so there's hardly anything to do come service time. Service intervals are two years, 30,000 kilometres, which is very generous. More generous is the fact that they'll look after things like your wiper blades at that service. You also get three years of servicing as part of the deal, but we don't really know what happens after that. So that's a bit weird. Also, you do not get a charging subscription like some other car companies give you. All right, let's start with a couple of really important details. The first is the range. Now, you'll have read that there is a range figure of 418 kilometers, which is the WLTP, and you will also have read that there's a range figure of 450 kilometers, which is the Australian design rule, the ADR rules, the same way you get fuel figures. You are not going to get that kind of range out of this car. That is a little bit frustrating because when you look at something like the Hyundai Ioniq 5, it says about 450, you get close to 450. And it's a bit frustrating that it doesn't get really that close. And the second thing that's frustrating is that when you do charge this car, the screen tell, doesn't tell you that you're even with a full battery that you'll get that charge. So clearly there's something not quite right. And so because the software is a little bit vague about it, you don't really know how far you're gonna get on a charge. Like it, you'll get used to it and I certainly have quite quickly, but it's just kind of, why doesn't it have the range it says it has? And why when I fill this thing, am I not gonna get as far as I should? So bank on a range of about 350 Ks, maybe a little more from a full battery. That's not bad at all. And given the performance in this thing, that's okay. Second detail is the Google Maps thing in the screen here. Well, I've been bitching about the screen a little bit. The Google Maps stuff is really clever. If you've got a Google account, you can sync everything from your phone, which is really nifty but it also has a little button that you press to tell you where the nearest charge station is. That's really clever. The second thing is it talks to the car and when you say, I wanna go from A to B, it tells you roughly what charge you're going to have left when you get to B. I think that's really, really smart. And then you can tell it to go and find you a charge station if that's not gonna work out for you range-wise. So that's good. It's just a pity the rest of the stuff on there is a bit ordinary. Now let's get to the big stuff. The way this thing drives, is really good. Because this is the only one in the range, it's got everything in it. 300 kilowatts, 660 Newton meters of torque, and that's split across the front and rear axle. And my giddy on, this thing absolutely hammers. It's so quick. Yes, I know there are faster Teslas, and they are dumb fast, but they're also three times the price of this. I mean, you don't have to drive it like that. You can just drive it like a normal person, but if you need to do something on a freeway or in traffic, you need to go for a gap, you will get it. <laughs> There's just no way you won't because this thing goes like a stuck rat. Now it does run on 20 inch alloys and those are like, that's a lot of wheel, which means that's not a lot of tire. So the ride in this is quite firm and you will notice it. It's, it's not the kind of car where the firmness will just kind of bleed away from you. It is firm and stays firm. 
That can get a little tiring after a long day behind the wheel or you're on a bumpy road like the one I'm on now. It will, it's fatiguing, just put it that way. So it's something you need to know. And if you don't like a firm suspension, this car is not for you. Having said that, the firmness delivers a really good high speed ride and it is a, a very comfortable car to cruise around in, uh, to cruise on the, on the freeway in. The only problem with the freeway is because these Pirelli P0s are pretty big, they do make a fair bit of noise and I can pretty much narrow it down to the fact it's the tyres making the noise because I was driving a completely different car yesterday that has Pirelli P0 tyres and they were really noisy. So that's something to know and you really, you're hearing them because the engine, they're not here, they're electric. So this car does have one pedal driving like a lot of electric cars. What that means is it uses the, the engines or the motors to recover energy when you lift off. So it gives you the electric version of engine braking. Now in this car, it's either on or off. And when it's on, it is on. Like when you lift off, you really feel like the car is braking. Other cars are a bit more gentle. And the idea of one pedal driving is particularly in traffic, you don't need to use the brake pedal itself. So you just lift off and you can coast to a halt and the car will stop without you having to touch the brake. And it, obviously it turns the brake lights on, uh, particularly if it brakes hard so that, you know, the people behind you don't run into you. That is a question I get a lot about one pedal driving, but it's something that in any electric car that has it, you, you learn to adapt to and you end up just kind of feathering the throttle if, you, if you're pulling up too short or um, then switching to the brake if you do need to stop a little earlier. You learn really quickly. The first car I drove with that was a BMW i3 and it was close to perfection. This one is just a little bit much. And again, unlike the Polestar 2, it doesn't have levels. It's either on or off. So I tend to drive with it off in the faster stuff just because of the unsettling way that it does, when you lift off, it does brake reasonably hard. But in the in the city, it's, it's, it's good, but you do have to realize that it brakes a little harder than you might with the brake pedal. But once you work it out, it's a really good thing because it does help you keep a little bit of extra range. The other thing about cars with one pedal driving, often the brakes are a little awkward. This is one of the best set up brake pedals in an electric car I've driven so that when you do decide to use the brakes, they do feel quite natural. And the transition between electrical energy recovery and physical braking, like I've just done then, is pretty smooth. And that's, that's really what you want. You don't want an electric car that drives remarkably differently to, except for that bit. <laughs> you don't want an electric car that drives remarkably differently to a normal car because that's what people are coming out of. Um, the steering on this is really good. I wasn't expecting it to be brilliant. I mean, it's quite good on the, uh, on the ICE cars, but because, you know, the weights are all different, sometimes car companies have a little bit of trouble uh, tuning and calibrating steering and, and ride and that kind of thing. But yeah, the steering on this feels really good. It's got good weight. Uh, you can actually select whether it's light or, or firmer. I've got it in firm all the time because it feels good and, and you, you get a good idea of what's going on underneath you. It's quite a lot of fun to drive. It's, it's not as fun as the Polestar 2, but then again, you, it's also, it's much higher, it's heavier, and it's kind of, it doesn't have the Erlen suspension option that you can get in that Polestar 2 dual motor long range, which is pretty much mechanically the same as this, just in a lower, sleeker body. Making the XC40 electric has made it a better car and it is, well, almost worth that extra money. I would like to see more range in this. 350 odd Ks at every charge, I want a little bit more. I think people really want to see 400 or more come up on their screen and actually get it. Apart from that, I mean, it looks brilliant. It's got a great interior, does need a better media system, but that is really a bit of a niggle. I would like to see maybe a cheaper front wheel drive version like the Polestar. That way you'll get more range, but you'll still have all of the cool. And as it turns out, the Swedish say voila, like the rest of us. We've got a lot to... Uh. Blow down. Blow down. I also had something crawling on my neck. <laughs> all right. Obviously we have... Jerk. Jerk birds. Disc brakes and rotors, that kind of thing. It's very generous. Oh, man. You distracted me. Like, that's the reason. <laughs>